Promoting innovation is a prevailing trend, locally, regionally, and internationally. What is the current picture for Hong Kong in the innovation sector? How can this city stay competitive among its counterparts in the foreseeable future? In this Insight Forum organized by our Hong Kong Foundation, various guests will discuss the present situation and outlook for Hong Kong's development in the innovation industry. To kick off the forum, the Financial Secretary, Mr. Paul Chan, will introduce the government's participation and upcoming plans in developing the innovation and INT sectors. I'm pleased to join you for this, our Hong Kong Foundation Insight Forum. Today, we set our sights on the future of Hong Kong as a regional innovation hub. Before stepping into the future, we have to understand where we stand now. We all know the importance of innovation and technology, INT, to our economy as a strong impetus for growth. It diversifies our economy and creates quality jobs for our people. And we are determined to build Hong Kong into an international innovation and technology hub which is underpinned by the national 14 five-year plan. As many of you are aware, the government has been spearheading efforts in a number of major areas to advance our INT development so that it would facilitate our economic transformation. We have poured in more resources to build more R&D infrastructures and promote R&D. We have implemented measures to attract more talents and to revitalize our venture capital and private equity regime. We also enhance the government's procurement policy to embrace more innovative products and update our legislation. In the past five years or so, we have invested over 150 billion for INT development. The results today are clear and compelling. Even amid the pandemic, Hong Kong startups soared from about 1,000 in 2014 to currently about some 4,000. Over the same period, venture capital investments rose from 1.24 billion to nearly 42 billion. The number of people employed in the INT sector rose by 30% to more than 45,000. We have also seen growing popularity of STEM in education, with more university graduates majoring in related programs. But in a world where competition for INT talents and companies is very keen, we must do more. Allow me to touch on a few things that we are working for Hong Kong and the future we can see. We are working out a strategic plan or a roadmap that will set out the directions and objectives of Hong Kong's INT development in the coming five to 10 years. We plan to roll it out within six months of this new government. One priority of all this is to build up an overarching ecosystem for INT. It is essential to promote cross-disciplinary and cross-jurisdictional collaboration among the government, the industry, the academic, and the research and development sectors, so that we will be able to connect upstream research to midstream and downstream market. Hong Kong has long been well regarded for excellence in research, but only when research outcomes are better integrated with commercialization and products, could we expect our INT development to be more sustainably powered? Another focus is INT infrastructure. Under the Northern Metropolis Development Strategy, the Hong Kong and Shenzhen Innovation and Technology Park and the Lok Ma Chao Santin area will form the Santin Technopole. The Technopole, together with the Shenzhen INT Song, will rise as a world-class INT hub. 
with Hong Kong at the fast beating heart of it. Joint venture in INT infrastructure also signifies blooming collaborations between Hong Kong and our sister cities in the GBA. If Hong Kong wants to become a regional innovation hub, we must see each of our strengths and capitalize on them. Indeed, there is much room for Hong Kong and other GBA cities to work together, such as consolidating our INT resources, including people and capital, and synergizing our research capabilities and marketing potentials. But above all, people are the most valuable assets for INT. In the consultations for the CE's policy address, we have fully heard the need for Hong Kong to attract more talents and strategic enterprises to come here to help power our whole INT sector. Rest assured, we will roll out measures to achieve this. Ladies and gentlemen, we believe Hong Kong is on the right track for INT. With all our endeavors and the strong support of our country, the future of Hong Kong as a regional innovation hub looks extremely promising. Thank you. The second speaker is Dr. Victor Fong, Vice Chairman of our Hong Kong Foundation and the Group Chairman of Fong Group. He will define the essential steps in the process of innovation and explain how Hong Kong can make use of its advantages and position itself to stay innovative and competitive. Innovation is on the mouth of every leader in the world today. You look at the, every speech um, President uh, Xi Jinping has made, we talk about innovation. You look at the 14th five-year plan, we talk about innovation. And our leaders in Hong Kong, I think, have rightly emphasized innovation at every turn. You look at the West. I remember President Biden's inaugural speech focused on innovation. So innovation is absolutely the marquee and the focus for the world around. But what I'd like to do is really to um, dig a little deeper today into the world of the practitioner and beyond all the wonderful measures that government has done in infrastructure and so on, to look at Hong Kong. Really, what does it mean to the society? What does it mean to actually the industry? And how important is this role of innovation as we actually develop it? I think innovation is really at the heart of productivity in an economy. And I think an economy can go on and on, but the key is how to raise our productivity level. Without innovation, we don't have the right amount of productivity increase, and that does not bode well for the long term of an economy. Also, I think innovation really provides opportunities, opportunities for startups, entrepreneurs, the development of venture capital, and all the way to nurturing them as eventual unicorns. And I think this is very important from a societal standpoint, because not only does it provide opportunity for our young people, but it provides upward social mobility, which is, I think is absolutely essential. To me, it should be the greatest path to social mobility by focusing on innovation. It pervades the whole society because if you go behind innovation, what is really the basis of innovation? Of course, we're focused on STEM, rightly so. I come from that whole area, and that is the core of the core. However, behind it is, I think, the whole concept of creativity. How do you maintain a level of creativity in a society? And that really goes deep into our education system. I don't know, for there's so many educators in the room, I don't know how you teach creativity. Or how do you create a teaching environment in which creativity can thrive? I can't answer that question, I'm just posing it. But I think that is actually at the heart of it. So what I'm really emphasizing is innovation is at the heart of our society and is at the heart of our economy and the heart of our industry. What I now like to do is to give you a, perhaps a, a little deeper dive into what I mean by the innovation process. Now, 
This is much more from a micro bottoms up from a practitioner standpoint, if you would. Uh, what is that innovation process? People very often equate innovation with zero to one. A very famous author, Peter Thiel, in Silicon Valley, wrote a very, very important book called Zero to One. Now, Zero to One actually signifies the creation of an idea and all the way to a working prototype, okay? But I ask the question, is from the idea to the working prototype enough to complete the <laughs> innovation process? I say absolutely not. To me, the journey has to be from an idea, from a creation, from a scientific discovery, all the way to something, a product that is commercializable, that satisfy consumer demand, that have a place in the marketplace, so that you can actually do mass production and distribution around the world with it. So the process doesn't end with the creation of the prototype. That is perhaps the first stage in the process. The second stage is what I call one to 10. Now, what does that mean? That means now that you have the prototype, you've got to do enough testing with consumers, okay, to find out, that, does it have all the relevant features? Can you have a different product that satisfies the, the consumer's needs a little bit more? And really what you need is to produce 10 pieces, or sometimes, you know, depending on the product, you may want 100 pieces. But if you're doing a robot, you may only can do two or three pieces. But whatever it is, it's small lot production. You want to do it very fast and test it in focus groups with consumers who are knowledgeable and give you the opportunity to redesign that product. And if necessary, go all the way back to the zero, all the way back to the origination of the idea or the origination of the invention to do this again. It's an iterative process. And what you need to do is to do this very fast so you can have many iterations in a very short period of time. And I'll mention in, in a moment how important it is to do this in a fast response way and also in small lots. So you don't have to go to factories that cannot produce anything smaller than 10,000 pieces per style or something like that. Now that one to 10 stage, I think it's, it's very important and it really perfects the product. Now, can we stop there? I would say no. There is a third stage to this process. Because once you have a product that satisfies the consumer needs, it actually says, hey, this, uh, if, if you have a new razor, it works well, I like the product. You've got to ask the question, how will this product perform in the marketplace? Is it priced properly? How is the position relative to the competitors? And then most importantly, what is the size of the consumer market that you can be thinking about production for? You know, all those things in my mind are an integral part of the innovation process. Because the innovation process cannot stop until you have something that is commercializable in scale. That stage three, if you would, I'm calling it from 10 to 10,000, because you probably want to produce a large enough lot size so that you can do a market test and be able to test the pricing, the positioning, and the appeal, and most importantly, to come out with a sense of how big the market is. So this idea of stage one is zero to one, stage two is one to 10, the testing in consumer groups, and then the stage three is 10 to 10,000. That, the three stages in totality, completes the innovation process. Now, I think Hong Kong is uniquely positioned to work on each of those three stages, and let me go into why. Uh, because I like to take apart those and really look at it in a little more detail. And we have the wherewithal to put all that together and to be able to create products very fast and eventually in scale. By the way, in our jargon, what we want out of this innovation process is what is known as the tech pack. After this innovation process, what comes out is a product that is capable of commercialization and scaling. So what we need is something called a tech pack. Those of you in manufacturing will know exactly what I'm talking about. 
which is an exact set of specifications on what the products will do, how much you're going to produce, and what sort of raw materials and parts you need to produce it. Only then are you able to turn it to mass production and distribution around the world. So really, end of that process, if you want to look at very real-world milestones, you end with the tech pack. Until you get there, you haven't done the process. And that is why, in my mind, if you don't look holistically at the three stages of the process, zero to one, one to 10, 10 to 10,000, and complete it, you haven't completed the process. And you start asking the question, why you have so many new inventions, but there's nothing coming out of the other end of the uh, commercialization, because you haven't completed the whole process. And I think that is the idea that I'd like to get across and which, in my mind, is essential to developing Hong Kong as a regional hub. Let me now turn to each of those stages and where Hong Kong really stands in terms of competitiveness relative to the, the other parts in the region or indeed around the world. I talked to my American friends. Silicon Valley is wonderful for zero to one. But I asked them, where is the one to 10? Small art production. And more importantly, where do you get the 10 to 10,000 to do your market testing? It is not easy. In some industries, they, they do very well, but not in all industries. So if we have the ability, you know, which is what FSU was saying, to work closely with the greater Bay Area and use their capability in different stages, the stage one, stage two, and stage three, and see how we can work at each of those stages, then I think we have a holistic model that will be world standard in this part of the world in the Greater Bay Area. Now, let me focus on stage one. Sometimes it's called a prototyping, right? It's from idea to the first sample, you know, a working sample. We really have a major advantage here because of our universities. What we need to do is to think about how we achieve that zero to one stage, that prototype, doing it as effectively as we can. Our advantage is very clear in stage one. Now, how about the stage two? This is what I would call the product design stage, where you're trying to perfect the product. Here, I think what you need are a number of things. You need the ability to produce very quickly small lots. Okay, and once that, and then you take that to focus groups and test those product features and everything. And when something is not quite right, you immediately go back and produce the second lot with a correction. So it's a constant loop of iteration. And so what you really need is manufacturing 4.0, digital manufacturing, that could very quickly take all this and really get it done and have the ability to do it. Now this, in my mind, is also ideally suited. If we can think about digital manufacturing uh, factories that are startups that could be done at Science Park or in Cyberport or even in fatted factories, Hong Kong style, that doesn't take much land. But you go upscale with digital manufacturing, okay, manufacturing 4.0. It really is an opportunity for us then to do that process well. I would call this an opportunity for the reindustrialization of Hong Kong. It's focusing on doing the stage two of the innovation process and using digital manufacturing to accomplish that. It provides the right type of jobs that allow us to trade up high level technicians and so on. And it suits our environment because we don't have a lot of availability of land. It's doable in the flatted factories. That are two more things I like to emphasize at this stage. Do not underestimate the importance of our airport. Because in this stage, you need availability of parts, you need availability of expert advice that would be able to communicate and come in very quickly, almost instantaneously, so you can iterate very fast. You want to, okay, redesign the product, you need a part, Hong Kong doesn't have it, you fly it in, we depend on the airport. So airport is an integral part of this advantage. And then finally, I'd like to also say the savvy consumers that we have in Hong Kong are quite up to date on fashion, uh, global trends and so on, that will provide the people that you do the focus groups with. If you're doing this in the middle of 
the jungle, and you don't have the consumers to test your product, what's the use? Hong Kong consumers have the ability to help us with this stage. And so let's not forget them as one of the major advantages. And then the final stage, the 10 to 10,000. The test market should be on the mainland side of the Greater Bay Area. We've got uh, 80 million very affluent uh, consumers, 20,000 per capita income. And that's where you do your test market, the, the prior positioning, the pricing, etc. And that's where you come out. So our ability with the infrastructure to be able to go back and forth, don't forget at every stage, we may need to go back to zero. So it's a process of iteration. So the infrastructure to allow us to iterate very quickly is absolutely essential. This is what, what I mean uh, by the uh, process. I'd like to just finish a few uh, uh, important points. The first point uh, I, I would like to just mention very quickly is when you talk about stage two, and in fact, mostly stage three, we will be seeing a stream of new products that we want to do test marketing on. I think we have the opportunity to set up Hong Kong at the retail level, like the Tokyo district called Akihabara. <laughs> My son goes to Tokyo, when he gets off the plane, first thing he goes is Akihabara. Why? New products. The latest. If Hong Kong can be used also for that purpose, I think it forms an important plank uh, to rejuvenate our tourism, which I think is absolutely essential. We need to answer the question of why do tourists today want to come to Hong Kong? And this may be an important addition uh, to why they want to come to Hong Kong. So I think it's something to think about. That's one thing just as a reminder. The second thing I'd like to say is also quite important for us to, to understand. In many places in the world, innovation is synonymous with technology and STEM. Uh, I come from that world, I know exactly the importance, and I still think that is the most important part. However, we must recognize that not all innovation are coming from technology. There are non-technology-driven innovation. That is very important. If you analyze it from a businessman standpoint, it is really innovation in business models that ultimately make a lot of economic sense and make a lot of money. Now, those models could come from using technology, which very often it does. And technology is a catalyst for coming up with those new models. But it can also come from things not related to technology, like art and culture culinary, etc. So for our society, I think we need to also emphasize that you don't really need to be an expert in STEM to participate in the innovation process. And I, I think that is a very important message, that innovation is creativity, and mostly at the end of the day, coming up with, as a businessman, new business models, new ways of satisfying the consumer, and then giving the consumer a new experience, a new product, it could be also services, which may or may not depend on technology. So I see this as, number one, absolutely technology-driven STEM. Number two, we need to think about areas that are not technology-driven to increase creativity and also to uh, think about how we create that innovation hub. So, ladies and gentlemen, in summary, I've given you a deep dive into the process, the stage one, the stage two, the stage three, and I think Hong Kong has unique advantages in both those stages. But when we put the whole thing together, I think that's when we have achieved in terms of Hong Kong as an innovation hub. I'm not aware of too many places that actually have those three stages. I would say, if you press me, the closest competitor would be Tokyo Bay. They would have all three stages uh, down pretty well, and we may want to study that as a way to develop ourselves. But our scale and so on, I think, would eventually transcend even the Tokyo Bay Area. So this, in my mind, is going to be the core to our future competitiveness. Because as the world now moves to digitalized manufacturing, and as the consumer gets more and more empowered by, by technology in this uh, little machine here, we need to innovate and come up with a large number of new products
to satisfy an increasing number of niche markets and do it rather quickly. It's a fast response, low minimum order quantity, low MOQ, fast response manufacturing. And I think innovation is at the heart of that. And that, to me, would be the mainstay and the core of Hong Kong's future competitiveness. Okay, thank you very much. Coming up is a panel discussion between Dr. Victor Fong and three giants in the innovation sector. They are Dr. Sunny Chai, Chairman of the Hong Kong Science and Technology Parks Corporation, Dr. George Lam, co-chairman at Hong Kong Aerospace Technology Group, who is also the former chairman of Hong Kong Cyberport Management Company Limited, and Mr. Simon Long, founder and group CEO of WeLab. They will share their first-hand experience of working on projects and creating businesses with a focus on promoting innovation and they'll analyze the outlook for Hong Kong's development as it strives to stay competitive in the region. A big hand for our panelists. Uh, these are the real entrepreneurs. <laughs> Let me start with you, Sunny. You have really um, saw the development of the Hong Kong Science Park for 20 years now and have become a major part of Hong Kong's uh, innovation scene. Uh, all the way from incubation to venture capital and all the stages up, up to the nurturing of unicorns. So you've seen all the stages. What I'd like to do is to ask you, is Hong Kong's infrastructure adequate for that? Are you happy with the type of infrastructure that we have today? And what sort of new infrastructure would you see that we need to add to continue our progress in innovation? Especially, I have in mind the northern metropolis and uh, what the FS mentioned is this, the, the Sun Tin Technopole. I don't even know what it really is. So you may want to give all of us an introduction to that. Thank you, Victor. I have served at uh, Innovation and Technology Commission for the last 16 years, two R&D centers and then Science Park. And uh, if I have to say, the infrastructure or, or the support from the government that really uh, took off was from these uh, 10, 15 years. Of course, Science Pass is celebrating our 20th anniversary, and we saw a very tremendous growth so up to today, we have uh, uh, over uh, 1,100 uh, tech companies at Science Park. Um, our tech population there is uh, 17,000 uh, uh, people working at Science Park. 11,000 of them are the R&D people. So what does 11,000 mean? In Hong Kong, uh, I know there are academia uh, experts here. We have about 40 to 45,000 R&D people in Hong mm. Kong, including those working at university as a researchers. So meaning one out of four researchers, R&D mm -hmm. people are at Science Park. So in terms of infrastructure, I must say in the last two terms of government and including this, this term, the support given was uh, really tremendous. I always say it's a golden uh, stage mm. that I've been working as an entrepreneur for the last 35 years and this is something that I've not seen before. So the, the infrastructure different, you, you, you can name it, in, like in Science Park, I mentioned all the facilities in various technology uh, to support um, startups, tech company growth, uh, communal labs, and also at uh, Cyberport as well. And also at uh, what we used to call industrial estate, yeah. uh, we have rerammed it two years ago, sorry. Uh, we call it Inno Park now, and we don't just rebrand or just rename, rename it as Inno Park because we have, we have gone through what you have mentioned in your speech from uh, 1 to 10, uh, <laughs> partially of 1 to 10, because we have gone through a, a, a very thorough consultation. We took three years on that. We had consulted with uh, two uh, consultants and we went through all that. The purpose is to follow the government's uh, reindustrialization mandate. Yep announced in 2015. So we have uh, renovated one of our buildings in Taipo without major theme. So you're following this reindustrialization yeah, yeah. strategy? With, without a major theme of yeah, what we should be important. doing with that building. Yes. So 
but after we renovated, it, it all rent out in six weeks. Okay. Yeah, we had the feeling that people would do need uh, to do manufacturing in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. So, but we don't know. Yeah. What What are those? Well, just, just a quick follow up question before I get to the other panels. In any sort of uh, promotion like this, there's importance of having anchors, right? MNCs. Which industries are you targeting to bring to Hong Kong? In my mind, we may not be able to be too general. We need to make some choices. Where do you think the opportunities are uh, for Hong Kong to attract the types of anchors okay. that we need to stabilize these uh, facilities and so on? Thank you, Victor. I think my colleagues uh, at Science Park here won't like me to, to say something that I should be saying in the next retreat. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, we have been using the word anchor companies for, for many years. Of course, like, like, like you mentioned, we were targeting at MMCs, but somehow, I mean, should it just be MMC? So Anchor could be any tech company who give great influence to Hong Kong GBA INT ecosystem. We call them Anchor. Okay. So today, our Anchor could be Zen's Time, could be Huawei, could be a company for some electronics modules. But they might not be an MMC. Okay. okay. So whoever can join our ecosystem and really contribute to the entire ecosystem and link up the collaboration as a custody effect, mm -hmm. we call them anchor. Okay. Doesn't have to be okay. MMC. Thank you very much, Sunny. Let me move to you, George. You you have been chairman of Cyberport and very successfully you really established a whole fintech industry there. Uh, but I, I like to focus more on you as a person and your background. You know, I read your resume, it's very impressive. You go all the way from <laughs> business, science, all the way to law. How do you think that has helped you in developing your career? And especially, I want to focus on uh, really you as a kind of potential role model for some of our younger people wanting to get into the innovation space. And even more importantly, uh, the type of people that we want to attract to Hong Kong as our talent pool that would fuel this whole development of the uh, innovation process. Thank you, Victor. Actually, you are my role model. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, also, oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I'd like to uh, give a big thanksgiving actually to the uh, to the government also for building up the ecosystem. Uh, uh, Victor, you mentioned before about the uh, Tokyo Bay area, yeah, yeah. and uh, they try very hard. And I think for Hong Kong, I agree with you, we are probably one of the very few, if any, that can have all stages, as you mentioned. In fact, I can be as aggressive as saying that we should actually change one word of this good theme, and that is, as a global innovation hub, because, <laughs> because we, are, uh, we are China's global city and we are Asia's global city. And there's no reason why we can find ourselves you know, regionally. Uh, and this is where we can be more competitive to Tokyo Bay Area. Because Tokyo, Tokyo Bay Area is more traditional, more, a bit relatively more inward looking, a bit more focused mm -hmm. on Japanese mm -hmm. economy, mm -hmm. uh, although they try hard. But Hong Kong is uh, global native, you know? so uh, I, I think uh, that's one point I like to add quickly. But okay. as to my background, yes. I, I think uh, having the uh, privilege of working with the Cyberport team for the past six years, I learned one thing, and that is I'm still a student. Uh, we need to equip ourselves all the time. It's lifelong learning. Uh, that's, that's very key. And so you keep on equipping yourself you know, for new opportunities to solve problems. At the same time, it's very important to think about interdisciplinary uh, application okay. and synergy, cross-fertilization. Mm -hmm. This is what happened to the FinTech hub at Cyberport. You've got bankers coming from Central, and we've got data scientists and so on working together. And then all of a sudden we say, well, let's do more data-driven innovation for the banking sector mm -hmm. and for the insurance sector as well, for example. And then we have arts people coming you mentioned about creative uh, industry. They work with the digital tech people, and you have art tech, and then so fintech, art tech, insure tech, 
And then the lawyers come, we have reg tech, regulatory technology, and law tech, and so on. So this interdisciplinary approach is very important as well. Another thing is, uh, it is very important, as you mentioned, the non-tech people should be part of the process. Yeah. It is good yeah. to learn about non-tech subjects yeah. as well. Yeah. My final point is that uh, it's important to really have this uh, uh, teamwork because uh, in my experience with startups, I think the, the winning cases are always uh, a team effort. You know, I remember uh, quite a few years ago when I watched the World Cup, I didn't even recognize any uh, German players, but the German team won because it was teamwork. I have uh, nothing to add but to say that it's a great uh, thing to be uh, an entrepreneur, a tech entrepreneur, but uh, don't just think about money. Uh, okay. you know, solve some problem for society and for the economy, make the world better. So I think you know, what we can say is uh, emphasizing the Global Innovation Hub, we stand for global, we stand for green as well because it's right. sustainability right. and inclusiveness, right. but also governance. We have to do the right mm -hmm. things right. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. All the aspects of ESG. George, thank you very much because I want you to give a message to the young people. I was trying to get you to say what sort of qualifications you really need to succeed. And what you're saying is no specific, but you need to be broad and interdisciplinary and have a very creative mind. Now, I'm going to pin you down with a, just a follow-up question. Now, people talk a lot about talent, the fight for talent today. In your experience, you know, in FinTech and the whole experience, uh, you know, in your career with so many areas. Where do you think Hong Kong's most lacking in terms of talent? And in which areas? And how would we go about attracting and acquiring that talent base? That, that we are not, you know, really complete in ourselves? Well, Victor, this is a strategic question. I think for Hong Kong, I'm so glad that FS uh, mentioned and you mentioned about the strategic approach. I think we, we have no choice. We have to look far and look high, aim high. And the uh, talent is at the core of it. Uh, in Hong Kong, we have to ask the question, how come these days we have you know, a lot of talents, particularly in blockchain, for example, mm -hmm. you know, going to Dubai, the UAE, uh, and going to Singapore, and so on. You have to ask these questions, and you say, why? Now, is it because we don't have a smart quarantine solution yet, uh, but we have made uh, progress? Uh, but we have to answer questions like this. How come we cannot attract these talents you know, to Hong Kong? So that means that we have to do a lot of regulatory reform, including our uh, financial regulations to, to make it more tech entrepreneurs friendly, mm -hmm. to make it more tech investors friendly. Uh, we have to think about our capital market. For example, do we have carbon trading? Uh, infrastructure, do we have uh, green uh, finance infrastructure uh, developed faster and setting the pace for the region for global as well because we are interfacing with the EU, with mainland China and Hong Kong itself. We are the best place to actually pursue green finance excellence, for example. And uh, if China is pushing for net zero uh, carbon, uh, you know, achievement by 2060 and Hong Kong 2050, uh, then we got to have a green roadmap. How, yep. how do we take specific actions so on? So talent is at the core of this. So how do we do it? I think right now we have policies like tech talent entry program. Uh, we have the talent demand list and so on and so forth. We have ingredients in place, but we need this general assembly, this packaging, strategic packaging, uh, improvement of our policy, including immigration policy, how to attract the best talents here seamlessly, fast, and also with their families. Because if you don't attract their families, uh, support their family, you cannot keep the talents, yep. for example. Yep. And so a lot of systemic issues, and how do we make use of foreign talents to develop our own talents so that we don't leave them out. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, using Sonny's uh, term about anchor companies, yeah, I love that. I immediately, I want to invite the, the top tech companies in, in China, for example, 
around the world to come to Hong Kong, anchor themselves in Science Park, in Cyberport, etc., uh, in the northern metropolis. Uh, and that way, uh, I would say, input the new blood into the Hong Kong ecosystem. Imagine, for example, in northern metropolis, if, if we can have tens of thousands of engineers coming. Mm -hmm. And you know what they get? They get immediately a salary raise because the Hong Kong tax advantage. And then because they are right in the northern metropolis, they can go back to Shenzhen same day. Uh, no disruption to family life and so on. We have a lot of innovation that we can do here and what I loosely call regime innovation. So uh, I think our regulators in Hong Kong have been doing so well. There's room for doing more in terms of industry development okay. and also business development. So talents, talents, talents. Yeah. We need that and we have the uh, ingredients for success because this is a free port we have uh, multilingual and multicultural ingredients here. Yes. Uh, we, we are inclusive in thinking the government is, uh, has been promoting a caring community and so on. I don't see why we yeah. cannot attract talent. So it is about how to get it done. Let's do it. Thank you, George. Well said. And what you're really saying is instead of government making policies for innovation, they themselves have to innovate within government and government policy. And I think that's a very, very good thought. Simon, let me turn to you. You're one of our most celebrated entrepreneurs. Uh, you taking your wee lab all the way to a unicorn. The first question I'd like to ask you is, you, you have now pursued that journey right from scratch. How have you thought about that process? And what aspects as a practitioner, having gone through this, that you found that worked, that didn't work, and more importantly, I'd like to ask you, you know, as a unicorn, I'm sure you get a lot of invitations to be elsewhere, but why are you still in Hong Kong and the Greater Bay Area? What is it that attracts you? Thank you, Victor. I really echo to uh, the opening uh, keynote speech that you talk about, about uh, the process of innovation, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, for us, uh, we were founded uh, exactly 10 years ago. We were founded exactly 10 years ago in a very smelly office in San Juan. <laughs> and now we have uh, a, a thousand employees uh, across Asia Pacific okay. uh, with around 50 million users uh, and 700 uh, enterprise customers. For us, I think innovation is extremely important. You think about where we are at, we are in, uh, in the fintech industry, right? The core sector is financial services. And financial services is a very peculiar sector. It's a sector where size, scale, history matters. We are facing competitors, very large banks, mm. with more money, more people, and like 100 to 200 years of history. So we have to constantly ask ourselves, how do we win in a in sector like this? And it's not by more money, not by more people, and we don't have a time machine. So it has to be through technology and data. That is what propel us forward. So if we look at uh, the thousand odd employees we have today, uh, close to half of them is actually in technology and R&D across the region, because we believe that that is, a, that is the path for us to innovate, develop new products faster and better. That is the first part of getting us off the ground. But the second part of it, which is very similar to what you were talking about, and I find it extremely interesting. Right? If you look at the uh, corporate transformation, a history of in in innovation of large corporates, right? as we transform from a small company to bigger and bigger, you have mm -hmm. to constantly innovate. We always say, if you do not disrupt the market, the market will disrupt you. You have to always catch up. And, and a lot of these innovations actually do not come from uh, suddenly coming up with a new idea, hitting a jackpot. It doesn't come from that. It actually comes from an existing asset that you have built over the years, and how do you find a new life in a, and apply it to a new environment, and how it thrive and grow. That is most our, of our innovations happen. For example, we first started off with a lending platform, and with that technology on risk management and KYC, we apply it to other markets, like in the mainland market. With that technology, we transform it to a lot of the account opening and the lending technology infrastructure for WeLab Bank in Hong Kong today. So it's about actually scaling from one to another. Mm -hmm. and, and, and fun story to share, right? Mm -hmm. Some of you may have, have heard this, um, Marvel, Marvel the company, Okay, many of you have watched the movies yeah. and stuff like that, right? Yes. They were founded in 1930s, and they actually filed for bankruptcy uh, in the 90s. And they were sold 
to Disney for four billion dollars ten years after that, and now of course they are worth like ten billion US. Now what happened during those period? Well, how did they transform to where they were, a bankrupt company to what worked? For a lot of them is they found that the core asset was the intellectual property of the、mm-hmm. comic characters, and the fun part was what they did was、um, they started licensing it. To Sony and different movie companies to make movies to test whether、uh, the the public audience accept seeing a comic character on a movie's big screen. When it did work, they started financing and start making their own movies. The first one being Iron Man. Now it's extremely popular, and and the rest is history. So a lot of this has a successful formula. The formula allow the companies to continue to innovate to develop new both technological and business innovations.、Mm-hmm. I think that's the first part.、Right? The second part is、uh, Hong Kong. Hong Kong is a is very strategic market to us. I'm born and bred in Hong Kong,、uh, so that's why、yes. we we are here.、Uh, in fact, 400 of our 1,000 employees reside in Hong Kong. So majority、mm-hmm. of them in Hong Kong, where we have the group office and、uh, the WeLand office, the the WeLand Bank offices.、Um, this is a very interesting market for us, in particular for what you were referring to, the zero to one and the one to hundred,、mm-hmm. because it allow us to test a lot of new ideas. Um, and apply them. What is also attractive to us is in our area, we required、uh, opportunities and licenses for us to test ideas. And the Hong Kong government, in particular Hong Kong MA, were quite forward-thinking in issuing licenses on digital payment,、uh, digital insurance, and virtual bank licenses.、Uh, quite a few years ahead of the rest of the Asian counterparts. So it allow us to start attracting talents, testing new ideas, and、mm-hmm. through these. We can actually find out what worked and what didn't work, adjust before we scale them、yep. into other markets as well. So we did a lot of these. So I think, I think,、uh, just to cut it short, I think, I think these were actually great opportunities for us、uh, in Hong yeah. Kong. Yeah. No, thank you very much, Simon. I think your journey is really such a classic. What we really need is to do what you've done in scale. <laughs> we, you need to inspire and bring along a lot more young entrepreneurs like yourself. Now, before I let you go, I'm going to ask you a, a slightly deeper question. I totally agree with George that you know we really have to focus on some of the big global issues today, like sustainability, etc. But I think one of the biggest issues in the world today is the increasing inequality of income between the rich and the poor. This increasing inequality, I think, is a major issue. In fact, I think it even underlies our. Our inability to solve other big issues. Okay, I just wonder for you as a fintech entrepreneur, what can you do to use fintech to do more in terms of equalisation and and bring the、uh, e- equality of income into a little better distribution and make this available to the man in the street, etc.、Mm, thank you. Yeah, that that is a very very good topic. I think.、Um, In in our area,、uh, financial <coughs> inclusion is a very important part to solve inequality.、Uh, if you look at the real issue of financial inclusion, it's a matter of cost. The cost to get served. For example, if it takes you、uh, a very high cost for a bank to serve you, the bank would not serve you. If it takes you like、uh, two hours to ride a bicycle to to a bank, you will not go to a bank. And if you live in a village, if you have a very difficult access to Uh, lending facility so that you cannot buy、uh, groceries or to top up top up your stocks in your in in your supermarket, you will not do it, right? I think a, a big part about financial inclusion or to solve financial inclusion is to reduce the entry barrier to financial services.、Mm. Now, a lot of what we do,、uh, in particular in in mainland China and also in Indonesia, is exactly that, right?、Mm. These are markets、mm. where you have a large population, highly dispersed from big cities to rural, and how do we actually find、uh, technological solutions? That allow them to, for example, gain access to credit.、Um, those are perfect example for technological innovation, where you, you can use alternative data, big data analytics, access to third-party data, combine them, and to do very accurate uh, assessment. Uh, in mainland China, many years ago, we started working with、uh, Postal Savings Bank of China.、Mm-hmm. A post office is a very interesting、mm, entity. Post office is about distribution and coverage of a society without the consideration of cost, because it's government goods. So they have post offices everywhere in China, and with that they build、uh, little mini marts. And we actually started lending money to those mini marts so that we can explore how we can actually help those SMEs to do better. Indonesia as well, we started doing、uh, similar things to see how we can use technology to solve financial inclusion. 
Oh, very good. Well, thank you very much. And what we've discussed today, I think, is not only one aspect, an important aspect of Hong Kong. I think it's fundamentally the core of Hong Kong's long-term competitiveness. I think we have to get this innovation piece right, and that would underlie our strategic direction for the next decades. So thank you very much for attending.